In today's news, government rushed to hold the Emergency House of Assembly meeting to exempt Neville Smith from vacating his seat after entering into contracts as old as eight months, totaling more than $170,000. BVI and Antigua and Barbuda discuss a small island development state's agenda. And government never attempted to hide a ministerial political advisor initiative, and this is according to Premier Andrew Foy. The fight against COVID-19 from the frontline front line fighters, that's Dr. Elson Vantable. He talks us through uh, what it's like being a frontline worker. And Olympian McMaster says he's focused on his execution ahead of his Olympic Games 400-meter hurdles event, which is scheduled for tonight, BVI time. All this and much more after a word from our sponsors. The wait is over! Is business slow, cash flow down, hosting an upcoming event? We can help. Advertise with 284 Media and take your business or event to the next level by enhancing your present marketing and messaging strategies. Allow our team of experts to create a personalized ad that sets your business apart from all the rest. This could be your business or event. So, what are you waiting for? Contact our marketing team at 284media at cctbbi.com. Advertising with us works. Well, welcome everyone. It's Thursday, July 29th, 2021. I'm Kamal Haynes. And I'm Ron Grant. We're coming to you live and direct from Tortola in the beautiful British Virgin Islands. A happy Thursday to each and every one of you from Jas Van Dyke to Virgin Gordon, Tortola, and of course, Anagata. We've got you covered. Before we get into our newscast at today, we're touching on a few items. Premier has a habit of hiring political consultants for parties, says opposition leader, the Honorable Marlon A. Penn, and jabs will be administered on St. John USVI for BVI residents as early as next week. And we start with news from yesterday, where the government of the Virgin Islands rushed to move a motion in the House of Assembly earlier today to prevent Territorial at Large Representative Neville Smith from having to vacate his seat after entering into two contracts with government agencies valuing more than $170,000. But this was revealed in today's order paper of the House of Assembly dated Thursday, July 29th. Well, according to the order paper, Caribbean Security Limited, of which Smith is a director in the company, formally entered into two contracts with the government dating back to April 8, 2021 and November 26, 2020, respectively, but the latter of the two contracts, which occurred approximately eight months after the, the contract was conducted, was for the installation of information communication technology equipment for the Royal Virgin Islands Police Force at several of their locations across Tortola. What the sum of that contract was $99,285. Well, likewise, the government also entered into a second contract with Smith's company, Caribbean Security Limited, in April this year to provide services for the installation of access control, video surveillance and burglary alarm in the Department of Information Technology and Telephone Services Management, Inland Revenue and Treasury Departments, and for additional installation, including building wildfire systems and relocation offices located at Skelton Bay Lots, Fish Bay in Tortola, where the sum of that second contract totals $72,917.56. Well, now, according to Section 67.3e of the Virgin Islands Constitution Order 2007, it provides that subject to subsection 7, an elected member of the House of Assembly shall vacate his or her seat or the member if the member becomes a party to a contract to the Virgin Islands government for or on, a, for or on account of the public service. But also, elected members will have to vacate their seats if any firm in which the member is or becomes a partner or a company of which the member is or becomes a director or manager becomes a party to a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands. However, section 67.7 provides that if the circumstances, if appears just to do so, the House of Assembly may exempt an elected member from vacating his or her seat under subsection 3E of the Constitution. But this is usually only applicable if the member discloses to the House of Assembly the nature of the contract and his or her interest in the firm or company involved in the contract before becoming a party to the contract or before or as soon as practically be after becoming interested in a contract with the government of the Virgin Islands as a director or a manager of such company. Well, I spoke to opposition leader Marlon Penn on the subject yesterday and he expressed his concerns stating that it was alarmingly concerning um, in terms of concerning him with one of the two contracts 
which is more than eight months old. Take a listen. Uh, all I could say, Kamal, is that uh, I think it's very concerning that eight months out um, that this information hasn't been declared. I think it speaks to the premier says one thing and does, an does another. I think we need to be more transparent in where we handle the business of territory. And the Constitution is very clear in terms of our members, uh, member having to to uh, declare this interest, whether it's before entering into a contract or soon thereafter. And soon thereafter certainly can't mean um, eight months after. Um, so, so it's very concerning that we're now seeing this and it's being done in an emergency meeting. Um, it's something that I have to that, that we all have to worry about. Um, that, that I'm deeply, I'm sure, I'm sure all the members of the public are concerned about as well in terms of the issue of transparency and accountability. Well, Penn also said that he did not see why the meeting was classified as an emergency meeting, says nothing on the order list, in his opinion, was deemed to be an emergency. It's, it's, it's basically what it says, um, come out. it's supposed to be an emergency. I don't see the urgency or the emergency of the government have to explain to us tomorrow what is the emergency and urgency of putting these things on the other paper. Even even considering that the, the contracts, one was signed in November and one was signed in April. So there were several house meetings in between then when those things could have been done and placed on other paper. The government came to the House of Assembly at many occasions and at, at, at the last minute added several resolutions, added several bills to meetings that we've had over the last um, seven, to, to ten, seven to nine months. So I don't see why these particular uh, pieces of um, resolutions weren't done then. Um, the, 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 the answer I got the, from the, the House of Assembly was that the, the meeting was supposed to be about um, getting the board um, of the Health Service Authority constituted. And that was the whole emergency for that particular meeting. I would not be surprised, Kamal, if tomorrow we, when we start that meeting that there are other things that are placed on the order of the day, as is customary under this administration, where they just pat the other people, whatever uh, resolution, pieces of bill that they want, I, mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see other pieces of resolutions or pieces of bills placed on order of the day, which, is, which has been the, the, the modus operandi of this government. As I said, the House of Assembly has become an extension of the executive, and the premier does that he wish with the House of Assembly in its operations. Well, viewers, that meeting was held virtually, the first of its kind to be held in the territory since the COVID-19 pandemic. Around obviously this this particular incident now is yet another controversial incident we see here um, coming out of this current government. You know, obviously we have the territory going through an ongoing COA investigation, and yet we see a contract which initially supposed to come to the House of Assembly yes. of similar matters. You know, in a short period after such contracts, and we see one of the contracts. You know, obviously um, just over eight months old, and the other. Um, um, signed since April, you know. Correct. And yet another um, controversial situation going on right now in the territory. Indeed. Kamal, I think the actions uh, by the government of the Virgin Islands uh, in this present situation, this particular situation, I think it speaks for itself. Um, and I'd allow the viewers to really take uh, what they want from that. Uh, we are at a very pivotal point, and I think we need to uh, be mindful of our actions, uh, particularly as you mentioned with the COI, uh, really for the betterment of our territory. Uh, viewers continuing on on a very, very special story, the fight against COVID-19 from the front line. We are at day 32 of the COVID-19 crisis here in the British Virgin Islands. And despite the pain and grief that has seemingly engulfed the territory, there are key personnel that continue to work hard behind the scenes to ensure safety and recovery. They are often overlooked, but they are an enormous, they have an enormous task at really seeking to uh, fight for their patients. Recently, I sat down with the frontline fighter himself, emergency care physician at the Dr. Diolanda Smith Hospital, Dr. Elson Vantable, and had an in-depth conversation at the fight against COVID-19 on the front line. Were you particularly? The first thing and, and is, is that, you know, nobody really saw it coming, all right? Um, you work in general surgery, you, you've got your patient list, the patients come in, they screen for an operation, some patients are admitted and they need emergency care. But there is a certain routine that goes with that. There's a certain um, amount of expectations that, that take place. Okay. You know, um, there's standard management, you know, there's a playbook that you follow that has been established and has been around for quite some time. So even if in the moment it's, it seems stressful, 
and you know you have to think on your feet always yes there is still something to quickly go back to no um, with this pandemic we are in a situation where we're constantly having to think on our feet constantly having to adapt to a situation that is changing on a day-to-day -day basis on the front line at the level of management even policymakers you know everyone is under tremendous pressure at this time and we keep hearing it over and over but it, it you really have to stop and think and realize how fluid and dynamic this situation is so with that level of change and uncertainty it becomes it becomes a situation where you're wondering okay um, is the guidelines going to change mm -hmm. uh, what do I do next you know you try your best but the next day something else might be thrown at you and you Correct. just have to kind of roll with the punches or accept new guidelines or what have you so and on top of that you know the 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 constraints, the workload can change in, in, a, in a moment's notice. Now viewers, as it pertains to how the emergency room is at presently functioning, Dr. Vantable shared what a typical day is like these days, as well as some of the overwhelming challenges doctors and physicians face on a daily basis at the state-owned medical center. Uh, a typical day, uh, I would say, hmm, from the beginning of this month, we have been in in, I'd like to say, crisis mode. Mm -hmm. The emergency room has been basically full to capacity wow. on, on most days. Every now and again, you know, we have a little a glimmer of hope. There's, there's a one or two beds that are free, but, you know, we're backed up and most of the patients that we're treating uh, are COVID positive. Okay. Um, so that poses some challenge in terms of infection control and where the staff um, moves in the department physically. So whereas before COVID, all areas of the emergency room were, were free um, for staff to move back and forth without having to worry about donning PPE and removing it and worrying about infection protocol. Yes. Now there's a lot of restriction. Um, you can't just bounce into to one room and out um, as quickly as you did before. Um, so it means that you, you sort of have to plan your actions in advance a lot more and you have to think, okay, how best am I gonna use um, my time? What all am I gonna do for this patient? Um, how many things can I accomplish um, by while just limiting it to maybe one or two um, entrances into the patient care area um, because you're also cognizant of the fact that PPE can be limited as well. Correct. All right. So um, the physical limitation of, of where to go and, and where to get what on top of the fact that, you know, the we're at a we have, we have limited availability of beds. Um, it makes it a challenge, particularly when new patients come in, whether or not they're COVID positive, you have to think, okay, where am I going to see this patient now? Exactly. Where am I gonna treat them? Where am I mm -hmm. gonna perform my assessment? Where can I have a conversation with this person and be out of earshot of other people who, um, whose business it is not? because we still have to think about patient confidentiality while this is going on. Um, so that has become very, very challenging. Um, it's an additional source of stress for a lot of us. Um, and on top of that, you know, there's, there's a the general tone in the, in the work environment becomes such that, you know, we are in a, take it as you go kind of mood. Understood. And while we do stay optimistic and, and hope for the best, we're, we, we're all human. And we still have at the back of our mind niggling, okay, 
what happens if you know another wave comes in and it's beyond our capability to yes. put physically put people someplace where they can rest up get oxygen get therapy be spoken to counseled whatever all right understood Viewers, that was the one and only Dr. Elson Vantapool, a young professional, one of the best and brightest of the British Virgin Islands, lending his services in these very critical time, a frontline fighter of COVID-19 at the emergency ward at Dr. Diolando Smith. If you happen to miss that interview, the full interview can be viewed on our website at tweetformedia.com as well as our Facebook page. And viewers, still ahead, Premier Andrew Foy says his government never attempted to hide a ministerial political advisor initiative. All this and so much more after a word from our sponsors. Brilliant Hands and Minds Tutoring Services, one-on-one -on -one tutorials in math and English, intense homework assistance, academic enrichment, school projects, effective communication and public speaking development, sign language for adults and children on Saturdays only. Registered with the Virgin Islands High School Certificate Program, Brilliant Hands and Minds can help you too. Offering intense curriculum-based training to help you or your loved ones get their high school diploma. It's time to make your family's education a number one priority. Hurry, space is limited. Brilliant Hands and Minds Learning Center. We are the trained education professionals. Of well, viewers, welcome back. What Premier Andrew Foy says his administration did not in any way try to hide the recent ministerial political advisor initiative from the people, stating that his government made sure the information was brought to residents through public publications. But well, Premier Foy made a statement during the recent broadcast of the Virgin Islands Party Let's Start radio program. Take a listen. We have the political advisors. We were told to, to uh, when after consultation with the governors, and uh, the governor and the deputy governor office to change it to ministerial political advisor. Some persons tell me, well, you know, you were had. You should have taken out that word political. But what's amazing about this topic is that we didn't hide it from the public. We were transparent and accountable, and it came out from cabinet. It wasn't a surprise. We know that cabinet minutes are public. And we made sure that we made sure that it get public. So it wasn't something that was hidden under the table. But the Premier also justified his government's decision to have ministerial political advisors, stating that it was necessary considering the present bureaucratic structure of the government, which has been posing several challenges, preventing a number of initiatives from being launched. We all know that the system needs some adjusting because all of us know that sometimes even to get a messenger hire takes months. Mm -hmm. And where you have something like the premier's office, which is supposed to be the engine office of any country, not the premier Andrew Foy, just the office. And that's depleted the staff. And we know how all of the other areas are. But now that has been allowed to, to be depleted over the years. And, and a lot of things that we have met has been things that where the can has been kicked down the road. Now we have asked for no new monies. As a matter of fact, we have done what is necessary to allow ourselves to go and civil all right. These are the criteria um, for the advisors. These are the, the, the job description. You know ministers in this room and I tell persons listening, this has been months of back and forth. So we have asked for no new monies, none. It was monies already allocated, but it would have been spent in some kind of other consultancy. So we decided, well, all right, let us target where those monies would be, at least most of them, and put them towards, since we have to wait for the system to click in through the different arms, which have a lot of bureaucracy, to get even a, a secretary or whatever, in terms of in the public service structure. Then the next thing that's available readily would be this structure for elected officials to get the help. Now, with that, if we had asked for new monies, if we had went and hide, if we had um, not done all that I have named before that we have done and still plenty more that I have not named that we are doing, I would say, well, we would, it would have a case. Our Premier Foy said if the bureaucratic system is not fit, regardless of the government in office, the existing problems will continue throughout the many administrations to come. This country is in dire need to build a strong public service, which I know that we're going to do with the deputy governor and the governor that we are working on now. 
I can't be held accountable for any past governor or or, or premiers or chief ministers or whatever for um, what they did or how they did it. How we got to this point where it's so depleted is something that persons also have to recognize. The system needs looking at. And I can tell you that no matter who is out there shouting about this, if we don't fix this system, even if you feel you need to move out this government and put in the next one, they're going to come right here and cry to you. Because if the system is not fixed, then the work of the people cannot be done. So persons wonder why things take so long in government. Other leader of government business in a statement issued on Monday, July 26, said that if the advisors were to be fully utilized by all eligible persons in his administration, the figures would not surpass $867,000. Uh, Kamal, very interesting uh, statement by the Honorable Premier because when we did our MAT, and I'm sure everybody else did our MAT, it did indeed come over to uh, a bit over a million dollars. So I'm not sure where these numbers are coming from. When you add up three uh, consultants for the Premier and one for each of the uh, 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 additional ministers, including the junior ministers, it does come up to over a million dollars. But particularly, uh, maybe our math is not so good. Uh, the premier was a math teacher, so we'll give him that. Continuing on, to date, the territory of the Virgin Islands has lost some 31 persons as a result of the COVID-19, with many other deaths occurring that are not COVID-19 related. So much loss in absolutely so little time, coping with grief and loss. Uh, we, of course, uh, understand that grief is defined as intense sorrow, especially caused by someone's debt. No doubt, there continues to be a cloud of grief over the Virgin Islands as we seek to maneuver through these very difficult times. Now, recently, I sat down with a psychiatrist specialist here in the British Virgin Islands, Dr. June Samuel, to discuss coping with grief and loss. I think the first place we begin is by acknowledging where we're at. Um, and that's one of the first stages um, that we, you know, when we've lost someone or we've, we're experiencing loss of any, of any type is getting to a place where we acknowledge and recognize what is happening. You know, this, this whole era with COVID, um, the way that the losses happen Yes. is different um, and the way that we're forced essentially to to grieve those losses is also different so we're experiencing loss at many different levels um, in our community you know we you know if we know that someone is going to transition we can be there with them um, but we're not allowed to at this time yes. so very often we're losing loved ones without having that opportunity to be there to say that last goodbye um, and just to have you know those kinds of moments that allow you to to just be with the person as they transition so that is one loss that that we also have to deal with and then you know we're going to talk about you know the loss of our normal rituals around um, you know having the remembrances yes. for our loved ones. So all of that run sets the stage for grief, which can be complicated. And so it's so important for us to ensure that we take the time out to, to grieve and to support each other um, as we go through this phase. Now, you mentioned as the first step to begin is acceptance. Now, I've spoken, had the opportunity to speak with many persons uh, within the past recent weeks who have lost a loved ones, their friends, the close family members, and believe it or not, many of them are saying, you know, uh, yeah, I haven't accepted it, I haven't thought about it, I'm just staying busy, it hasn't really dawned on me that uh, this particular individual uh, is no longer going to be around. Uh, so acceptance, uh, clearly, as you mentioned, uh, is essentially the first step. But for those of us who may be uh, somewhat trying to avoid uh, by staying busy, uh, there's also the stage of denial. Uh, can you walk us through that? Sure. So acceptance actually comes um, closer to the end, okay. uh, but acknowledging what we're going through is is that kind of a first stage. So, Understood. you know, initially we, we may be in denial. Um, you know, it's just so hard to believe, um, you know, I've, I've never been through a situation. Those of us in the healthcare field, you know, where we've lost 20 something plus persons within one week. Um, and that really is you know, can be hard to, 
to begin to acknowledge that that is what has happened. So sometimes, you know, um, because we're not ready to face what is happening, we may go into this phase of denial. Um, we push our feelings aside. We try to stay busy, um, not, you know, because of course experiencing the, the emotional pain, the physical pain um, that's associated with grief. Um, sometimes can be overwhelming. So some persons may get into that place of denial um, and not want to. Viewers, that was uh, Dr. June Samuel. In case you missed our interview, please visit that uh, 284 mediacom for the entire interview as well as our Facebook page. Uh, we also talked about the uh, well-being of children, which is very, very important. And now, viewers, to our final story of this newscast, Olympian Kyron McMaster will be the first from the three-member British Virgin Islands team to compete in the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games in Japan tonight local time. McMaster will be running out of lane number two in heat number four of the men's 400-meter hurdle, hurdle race between the hours of 10.25 p.m. and 10.57 p.m. local time. In responding to questions posed by 284 Media during a recent press conference, McMaster said despite a few obstacles in his journey ahead of the major games, he is confident with his pre preparations. He said he will be more focused on his executions during the race than the overall placement. Take a listen. My preparation leading into the games uh, has been amazing. Um, we hit a few bumps in the road, obviously, as you guys know, with me falling in Sweden. But that was just another hurdle for me to clear, which we cleared uh, gratefully. Um, made it to the Olympic Games there, and I'm very confident in what we are going to output on the track. Um, not really focused too much on the outcome of it. We're just taking it round by round, to be honest. Um, so yeah, my goals is honestly, is not to really focus on what I could do and what I will do. It's more so my execution. That's that's just my focus is how I get executed my race and stay stay within that realm of execution. I'm not trying to focus on what time I want to run, what place I want to run, or what medal I want to achieve. I know all of that will fall into place once we do our execution. And McMaster also spoke on how he has been acclimatizing to the COVID-19 environment in Japan, stating that he has not been greatly affected as, a, as it pertains to his usual routines ahead of his races. Um, in terms of COVID-19, how is it affected? I would say, it, for me, in the village, it hasn't affected much. Um, like Taisha said, you feel really safe here knowing that you have to take COVID tests every day at Wasta. Um, they keep the place sanitary as much as possible. The only thing uh, I would say it really impede on was like how easy it would be to get physical therapy as usually as you would. Um, usually in a perfect world, a therapist would have been able to come to you or whatever the case is, but you have to make adjustments and go to them or what's not. So I would think that's the only, the only issue. Apart from that, the food, food is amazing, really amazing. <laughs> Compared to what I've eaten at other games and what's not, yeah. So I think it, it, everything is straight for the most. Our viewers, that race can be viewed on CCT Live channel NBC between 10.25 p.m. and 10.57 p.m. local time. I meanwhile, Olymp Olympian swimmer Elena Phillips will be the next BVI athlete to compete at the games in lane one of heat number six in the 50 meter freestyle event but she also answered a few questions ahead of her event which will be held tomorrow friday between the hours of 6 23 a.m and 6 45 a.m take a listen well, my preparations leading into the games have gone really well um i've been feeling really comfortable and strong in the water so all around just very good and making me very happy and excited to race um Okay, no. <laughs> 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 so, um, my goals and expectations leading into the games, um, I would say my main focus is on progress um, over perfection. That's um, That's been my focus lately because my, my, prep, my 
road into the game hasn't been the smoothest, and I am aware of that, and, and I acknowledge that. So um, over the past seven months, I've made a lot of progress, more than I could have imagined, and I just want to keep that going. <laughs> and when it comes to COVID in Japan, I wouldn't say it, it's affected my mental state in any way, to be honest. Um, the regulations that we're following here are the same ones that um, my team and I were following on campus at FIU. So it really isn't anything. And just a reminder, viewers, McMaster's race in the 400 meter hurdles event will be between the hours of 10.25 p.m. and 10.57 p.m. local time tonight, while Phillips 50 meter freestyle event will be tomorrow Friday between the hours of 6.23 a.m. and 6.45 a.m. Both events can be viewed on CCT Live channel NBC. But that's all we have today, viewers. Thank you for joining us. And I'm Ron Grant, uh, wishing you a very uh, good rest of the day. Of course, we want to wish our athletes the very best. And viewers, we will see you tomorrow with your daily dose of local, regional, and international content. You've been watching 284 News.